All right. So, welcome to our first uh, live class from North Texas Psychological Association. Um, we are happy to be in this room thanks to Elizabeth Rudd to the Agricultural Extension Center. Um, so, uh, this is a beginner's class. There's going to be a lot of information covered. Uh, Stacy's going to go like this when it's getting close to 12 and 1 30. So, I can pace myself. Um, anyway, so thank you for coming and let's start the lecture. I'm going to have to stand over here so that uh, Zoom people can hear me and um, we're still admitting people. Don't admit people to what can. I think we have pretty much a lot of people are most of the majority there, okay. 19 participants. Okay. Started. So, um, let me just see. Sounds muffled to them. So can can you kind of just stand right there? Right here. Yeah, there you go. Okay. They're, they're better. All right. So we're going to cover fungi's unique characteristics. Okay. So um, if you're getting into mycology, it's really important to know why it's not a plant, why it's not an animal, a produce, etc. Um, so I'll get a little bit into taxonomy and the science of classification. Um, a little bit into the mushroom anatomy life cycle. All these. Uh, things I'm going to cover can be a class in itself. So we're going to try to get a whole umbrella of them. So uh, because of that, I'm going to cover, I'm just going to focus on two major phyla that you would see going outside right now. Okay, so chances are you'll see members of Ophidiomycota phylum or members of Ophidiomycota. So you can find bread loaves. So that's something you'll see. Uh, I call them to cover ecology, uh, different types of the um, relationships fungi have with the environment. They're either going to be symbi symbiotic, saprotrophic, and parasitic. A little bit on the importance of fungi, how to identify, and then a little bit on poisonous mushrooms, because I think it's really important you now, especially if you have a dog or you're watching a toddler and something. Just a little bit on it. Uh, new age of microphilia. You're all here because something about mushrooms have excited you. It might have been Paul Stamets, uh, Fantastic Fungi, or uh, what was it? Oh, okay, that's going to be impossible for me, but I will try. <laughs> okay, so next one. Wait. You know that the year we landed on the moon, the fungi were actually finally moved from the time kingdom. So those of us who still remember 1969, that was a long, no, that was not so long ago. For most of you in here, it was like a million years ago. But it's kind of unusual that it's not until 69 did we um, designate uh, fungi their own kingdom. So, but we owe fungi a lot because 500 million years ago, they first appeared in cave ways where plants and animals get on land. So, why are they their own kingdom? Again, this is back to basic biology a little bit, so bear with me. But, um, so how many of you have heard of domains, kingdoms, and all that stuff? Probably the majority of you. So, I might go quickly through this. What I might do is I might even skip a slide, and then if we have time, um, then we'll go, go back and do a more stuff. So um, basically, uh, here we have the different kingdoms, eubacteria, archaeobacteria, protista, plantae, animalia, and fungi. And you'll notice that um, animals, fungi, and plants 
mostly uh, multicellular, which means they're mostly made up of uh, many cells. There are exceptions in the fungal world, like uh, definitely yeast cells and single cells. Okay. Yeah, there we go. So, um, okay, so and then they're under eukarya as well. Okay, and this separates them from um, the bacteria. And all that means is that the nucleus is within a uh, lethal membrane. Uh, bacteria have the nucleus splattered all over the cytoplasm. So, that's probably not that important right now, but you know, something to refer to or to explain to people. Uh, fungi, like animals, absorb their um, need to get their food from outside sources. Plants, for example, use uh, photosynthesis, so they make their own food. And that's definitely why fungi are not plants. And fungi cannot make their own food. They absorb food outside digestion, um, which is different than animals, because we go out, we buy a hamburger, we eat it. And that's how we use that gas. Um, another really important uh, unique characteristic is that uh, fungi have a unique cell wall made of chitin. And chitin is the same material you find in crustaceans like plants and all that. So again, the cell wall of the plant is different. And as most of you know, animal cells do not have a cell wall. So again, that makes that unique. Um, they also have a unique sterol called ergosterol, only found in fungi, and we already went over next slide. Kingdom fungi are more closely related to animals than plants. I didn't mention that. Like animals, fungi make glycogen, glycogen that stores carbohydrates, unlike plants, which use starch. Okay. And unlike plants and animals, only 5% of fungi have been described. Up to 3.8 million still need to be identified. Mycologists all around the world need the help of citizen scientists, people like you guys. So, you know, you can start helping um, with the science of mycology. Okay, a little bit on basic taxonomy or the science of classification. Um, like all organisms, hi Ben, like all organisms, um, they are placed in kingdoms, phylums, orders, family, genus, species. And the species name, the scientific name, is what we call binomial nomenclature, two part name. Okay. So the way I count my students uh, to remember this uh, order is King Philip came over with the great spaghetti. And you guys might have another mnemonic in your in your biology. So we have. The two name system means you have the scientific name is made up of the genus and it's a specific epithet. Okay. And I noticed that some people use the word section. Also, we won't get into that, but that comes from the plant world. Um, a species is named using Latin root and it's always italicized or underlined. So, unfortunately, when you're on Facebook and you say, Oh, I found this. Mushroom that doesn't let you italicize in that kind of register. So notice the genus starts with the capital A, Amanita. The second part, the epithet, starts with the lowercase. So Amanita muscaria, which is the um, Mario Brothers mushroom you all know this. Okay, the common name is the fly agaric. So Amanita comes from the Greek, meaning Amitai, which means fungus in Greek. And muscaria means fly. So if you know um, a little bit of the Latin Greek uh, terms, it's easier to actually remember the scientific name. I would never remember fly agaric. So why don't we use common names besides? Does anybody know? I'll, I'll ask questions too. Yes, sir. Lots of different languages, lots of different localities. Uh, people just might come up. Right, yeah. I mean, I could call, I could call, yeah, here's the second one. So common names vary in region and language. Um, for example, here we have our, uh, our own Coriaceae fiesta, which is our uh, state mushroom. And some people call it the Texas star because when it's open, it looks like a star, right? But when it's closed, it looks like a cigar or a football. 
So if I say, oh, is that a devil's cigar? And I'm looking at it and I go, no, that's a potion. So that's why a common name are um, kind of annoying. So in Japan, the only other place where we find the same species is called Shigino Mataki. So again, if you're in Japan, you can't say, oh, you have a Texas star monkey. The only species name we have is the um, <laughs> Only three states have official state mushrooms, so kudos to Texas. Yeah. Really amazing. <laughs> okay, this is, a, um, this is just a fungi tree. It's kind of complicated. I'm going to come back to it towards the end if we have time, but I don't want to spend too much time. Because each, each file in there, you can spend four or five hours like doing that. Um, Sapos. Huh? Sapos. Sapos, probably. Yeah. As an eco. Yeah. Fungi classification is challenging and often changing. Mycospeak can be very confusing. So you're going to be hearing uh, mycologists like Sebastian saying all this shield stuff. You know, what is he talking about? He's like a cartoon. What is the pulverized spring and fermentation fungus polarified? Uh, over a large part of the heat. Why does it just say post? Okay. Mm. So that's an example of micro so, um, Classification is very challenging. Uh, you go through the trouble to, to learn the scientific name of the great mushroom, it's your favorite. And then it turns out the name's been changed because it happened to be a European name. And DNA sequencing shows that it's an entirely different. So um, that book, the Audubon um, book I was showing you, I bet there are a lot of names in there that no longer feel or have been changed. So um, you'll get the hang of the microwave terms as you progress. Okay, so let's start with a little bit on the uh, anatomy of a fungus. And a lot of people will start with the mushroom uh, fruiting body. Which, if I'm talking about trees and I start with, with an apple, does that make sense? No, I want to start by talking about the apple tree. So, and the, think of the fungal vegetative body, the mycelium, as the actual body of the mushroom. So, there's the, uh, we're learning mycospeak here, hyphae are the thread like filaments. Okay. And collectively, they become the mycelium. Hypha, hypha is singular, okay? And mycelium is singular, singular, and mycelia is plural. So if that doesn't confuse you, <laughs> I don't know what does. <laughs> so uh, if you're just coming in, welcome. We have a sign up sheet in the front. So um, anyway, the mycelium is a bundle of hyphae that form the network. Mycelia is plural. It's visible on bark, bread. Mycelia reproduce asexually. So, and uh, a nice picture of some mycelia there, thanks to Stacy, who's our class watcher. Um, she took this picture at, what was it? Um, Spring Creek? Anyway, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, mycelium is the actual fungal body, and this is where all the action happens. The action does not really happen on the, you know, what we call mushrooms. So here, uh, again, the problem is you rarely uh, spot the mycelium because it's deep within the soil or on the rotten log or on your bread. Okay, we know that. This is a fungal body that spreads out and feeds. This is where the change in nutrients happens. Okay, and once conditions are good, we call those abiotic and biotic, but we won't go there such as uh, proper temperature, um, soil, uh, nutrients, acidity, all these things are really important. If everything is perfect, then the mycelium will decide to uh, reproduce. Unfortunately, since the mycelium is out of sight, it is difficult to study. Now, I was going to click on SPUN, which is the Society for the Protection <laughs> of the Underground Network, but we're having internet problems. And, um, but you can go at home and I suggest you um, play around with fun. It's really interesting. If we have time, maybe we'll talk to you. Okay, so 
Okay, so um, the mushroom life cycle. If everything's perfect, then the mycelium will start to produce this hyphal knot, which becomes a primordia, the mushroom, and then comes the mushroom, spores are released, germination, and again, the whole process, hyphae are formed. So it's a cycle of life. All right, this diagram is with, um, this is basic mushroom anatomy and mycospeak, as we're going to say. The diagram includes the different types of spore producing surfaces. Okay, uh, on this one, on the underside, I found a mushroom that has the different types of under, um, underside surfaces. So, because everybody's used to the gilled mushrooms, but I want to cover also the kind that have pores. Okay, or teeth. Um, the mushroom is the fruiting body. The mycelium is the body of the organism comprised of a network of hyphae, microscopic filaments that gather nutrients. We'll start later. Uh, can you all hear, hear me well back there? Okay. Um, Michael terms that we're going to learn. Um, I don't have a pointer, but the peleus is the cap of the mushroom. Um, most people around here just call it the cap. That's okay. Um, the margin is the edge of the cap. The cuticle is the surface of the peleus. So we're just kind of going over these because you might you might pick up a mycology book and, and these terms come up. Um, the scythe is also known as the stem or the stalk. Okay, and again, we're trying to stay away from those plant-like terms. The universal veil is a membrane that covers that little developing mushroom, and when it body expands vertically. Uh, that's the universal veil that you might see. The partial veil is a membrane that covers the gills or pores of the mycelium that expands horizontally, leaves a skirt or an annulus. And uh, so the vulva is the base of the site. Now, the thing is, 90% of cytokines do not produce a mushroom body. So, again, but you can see that there's literally thousands that do that you will see this week. Okay, so I also uh, credited each diagram so you can go back and look at this for yourself. Okay, fungi role in ecology. All right, so really important uh, role is how they help trees, plants, and even animals because animals need food. So, but let's talk about some of the ecological roles. First one um, is a symbiotic role, and we call those the mycorrhizal fungi. They offer nutrients for plants, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. It helps plants retain water. It helps plants resist disease and remain healthier. Okay. Plants in return offer carbohydrates, vitamins, and essential nutrients for growth. So this is what I call a nice, mutualistic symbiotic relationship. And there's two types of mycorrhizal fungi. There's the endomycorrhizal, and these are, uh, they live between the cell wall and the plant membrane of the root cell. So they're really super connected. Okay, and produces globulin, which turns dirt into soil. So without these mushrooms, you wouldn't have farming. So, and they sequester up to one third of carbon. So, and these you really won't see. The ectomycorrhizal or EMF surrounds lateral roots of plants, not penetrating, and it forms a fungal sheath or mantle called a hardness net. So, and um, I think there's a book called The Mother Tree. How many of you have read that? I'm blanking out on the author's name, but she. In the 70s and 80s, discovered that there's a connection between the pine forest and its growth and its, how it, well it does, and the mycorrhizal mushrooms. So um, she found that connection and was able to help uh, the forest industry uh, produce better forests. She's on also on um, TED Talk. I think there's a point on Sorry. Yeah, we'll have to get one next time. 
Yeah, you're right. says is saprotropic se and saprophytic the same thing so yeah It's the largest organism on Earth. It covers square miles, not football fields. <laughs> There's actually a, a really rare, it's not, well, it's, it's becoming more rare because the Tibetans are actually going into the fields and finding this specific cordyceps, and it's uh, pound for pound, one of the most expensive fungi in the world <laughs> because of its medicinal values. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Okay.
So, um, and I'm I'm happy to send the recording to the Zoom people, and if need be, I could always do this again. <laughs> so don't worry. Uh, everybody, I have to do with the presentation here. I can do it uh, on another Zoom slide. Everybody will get a copy of the Zoom presentation video as well. So. Okay, so um, and actually, when I was studying biology and all that, all we talked about um, in terms of fungi is all those forms of diseases. But now we're kind of like saying, well, they have a lot of benefits. So, benefits um, of fungi to our uh, global environment, the role in saving our planet. Despite their importance, mycology is still an eclectic field in biological science, especially in the natural history. If you want to go in there and do DNA sequencing and come up with some hypothesis, then you're going to get funding. If you want to go in there and go, I want to find out all the uh, polypores down in northern Texas, and they go, oh, we don't have enough of that. That's not the case. So this is the role of a citizen mycology specialist. They're the ones that are going to be discovering really important things. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, health professor Carvin. Big problem with global warming. Um, makes the soil healthier and hence vegetation um, healthier. Recycles materials, minerals, and nutrients, and plant life. Okay. Recycling is really important. Another interesting thing about mushrooms is we can use them in micro remediation, which means we know that they break down uh, matter. So why not use something like oyster mushrooms to break down toxins? And there have been a lot of studies in that direction. Supposedly, they found a, a rare uh, Amazon fungus that actually is plastic. So the question is, do you want to use that to get rid of plastic? Well, what if it takes over and all your plastic is gone? That's, that's another thing. But um, it could, we could probably control it. Um, medicinal, again, antibiotics. Thanks to Alexander Fleming, we have penicillin discovered uh, right around World War II or earlier, and uh, that saved millions and millions of people. Thanks to fungi. Fungi are also used to make statins, which is lowering your blood pressure. A lot of people wouldn't be here. You, you guys probably would. You're not that old. If you have high blood pressure or something, so some of you are on statins. <laughs> They're also being looked at for anti-aging. Cancer uh, and of course, course mental health, health you know, psilocybin, depression, and PTSD. So that's all being looked at right now. Cultivation, Cultivation is really becoming bigger and bigger. And we have great sponsors on our website that they do cultivation. So you can go to their store and um, buy their products and grow your own oysters if you want. Uh, <laughs> Edibles have more fungus, have more fibers and beans. Uh, micro protein is a sustainable future food but for people around the world that are starving. Uh, those of you who are into cultivation, you know how easy it is to grow uh, fungi or uh, you know mushrooms. So it'd be a really easy thing for people from Greenpeace to go in there and show them how to cultivate their own mushrooms. So they have a source of food. Okay. Uh, we all know how important fungi are in the food industry, especially uh, brewers, yeast, and all that. We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, we're also looking at fungi to replace plastic or leather. Those of us who don't want to kill an animal or wear it, we can maybe get materials from uh, the fungus, fungi. Um, uh, Ikea is already using mycelial, mycelium to package their uh, their pieces that nobody can put together. So um, <laughs> at least that's me. So there, it's a good uh, place to research. Uh, more research is needed in all areas, including ethnomycology. Uh, indigenous people from all over the world have been using mushrooms for thousands of years, and we need to go back into those cultures and find out what what works for you know skin, skin lesions or something. And of course, China has been in the business of cultivation and medicinal for like 5,000 years in terms of fungi. So we're way behind, but we're catching up. 
So uh, any questions so far before I just introduce you to identification? Uh, how are we doing time-wise? Time? Okay, good. So since we're doing good, I'll slow down. So again, uh, I want to focus on the mushrooms that you will go and see outside in your backyard or on a tree or, you know, the next foray. So they're grouped for easy observation based on some aspects of the National Audubon Society field guide to mushrooms. Um, the only drawback is that all the names are common names. That's the one thing I don't like about this guidebook, but you could also get the Gulf Coast um, mushrooms, which covers most of the Southeast and some of the mushrooms in North Texas are there. So, and that one, that one uses scientific language to look up. Yes. There's not currently like a good, like Texas identification. There's nothing with North Texas guidebook, um, right? When someone asks a question, can you kind of repeat that? So oh, okay. people are. All right, Stacy want to know, um, in terms of guidebooks for Northern Texas, I don't know of any. Um, so maybe there's, there, there's nothing in our specific region, but um, there was one from the Gulf states that was just recently released by David Lewis, and uh, it's really informative. It was just released last year. So when you do purchase books, you want to purchase the most updated version. So you always want to look at the year it was published because, as Ava stated earlier, names change, right? So you'll be calling something one thing and then everybody that less depreciated. So that's why you want to pick the first edition. But it's always nice to have as a reference, you know, having these older books because they can come with a lot of value and knowledge. Yeah. I, I had a question since yeah. you know, we were talking about how this like the number of different editions are. Yeah. There's a lot of books that are confusing. Um, it seems to be the, the use case for like uh, a good website would be there because it's a very dynamic medium. Yeah. Are there any good resources that have yeah. more current information? Yeah. What's the name of that one? Uh, this so so uh, a member here just asked if there's any good online resources. If you go to our website, we have a resources tab and we have about eight to 10 links listed there and they're all very informative. Um, you just have to go to our website, North Texas Mycology, and then you click on the resources tab and you'll see uh, a list of websites and books that you can kind of reference to when you're trying to identify mushrooms. Oh, and someone just mentioned Texas Mushrooms Guide by Susan and Ben. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, okay. that's another good one. Yeah. Looks like this is saying that it's three hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, that's why I, uh, 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 that's uh, why I couldn't rationalize buying that with my husband. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's where you I wanted to kind of touch on that. So that's a good book to have, and the reason why it's so expensive is because it's a collector's edition now. They they are not publishing it anymore, and People are buying it up just to have it as a collector's item. <laughs> Did you pay three hundred dollars? Good. <laughs> as I say, whoa, she'll treat us to dinner after this. <laughs> so uh, another, another thing I would like to mention is uh, these mushroom books. They will increase in value usually over time because people will kind of like to find specific books that are older, and they'll have like uh, we'll eventually like to have an auction. You know that would benefit. The organization, and we'll have a bunch of our used books that people want to donate. Right, right. and we'll have like a silent auction where people can go walk through and see which books they like, you know, and kind of bid on them. Mm -hmm. So that's what we like to offer. So, um, so with this in mind, with all those no real good. Oh, do you have a question? I, I'm new to all this. I just want to ask a question. You said the names change. Does the common name change or just the scientific name change? Um, both? They probably both because common name, you know, like okay. next year instead of cigar, Texas cigar, you might call it the Texas football. Okay. Yeah. I guess so, but yeah, the scientific names are the ones who notoriously yeah. change. I must say though, like, you can't really get the scientific names that you need for the non but I mean, yeah, yeah. And there's actually a uh, website where you can plug in the mushroom and then they'll tell you the current name. And I think that's on our resources page. All right, 
So we're going to start with the biggest group that you guys visually enjoy seeing. Uh, most of us enjoy seeing gilt mushrooms or ignorance. Very large, diverse. You're going to see the word diverse in every slide. Apologize for that. Because you know, fungus, fungi are very diverse. Uh, these are easily observable, kind of complicated to identify. I always have to take a picture and send to Sebastian or someone on Facebook because I like it to me, it looks like a white mushroom. Is it a poisonous amanita or is it just a lupula garagus, which is you know, not going to kill you? So, um, many gilled mushrooms are edible, such as portadella, and a few are poisonous, such as the death cap. The good news is over 500 plats will kill you. And I think what, only 12? Mushrooms yeah, it's only just a handful. Just a handful. And, 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 and there's only pretty much one, the Amnita section Caloidae, uh, which we have a few species in the North Texas area that kind of look like that mm -hmm. in the photos, but they actually have a more distinct vulva. It's called the second vulva, which kind of looks like a sock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. notice this has a ring, which would mean when I first found it, I go, uh oh, do I touch it? Yeah, you know, by the way, it's, it's not going to kill you to touch even the poisonous ones. You have to actually eat it. So, but, so anyway, we'll, we'll go back to poisonous a little bit later. So gilled mushrooms are really pretty. They're found everywhere. They can be really, really tiny or, you know, they could be uh, pretty big. I've seen some of those Amanita muscarias, really huge ones in California. So, um, the Mario Brother ones. Yes. I got a question. Like, I read somewhere that the poisonous ones smell like paint. Huh. And, uh, yeah. uh, so, so, he was saying uh, he read somewhere that poisonous ones smell like paint. That's uh, not really a good rule to kind of base them off of because they're so variable. You know, some poisonous ones will smell really good to people, and that's why they eat them and die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Might even taste good for the first 24 hours. In, in the genus Agaricus, which is the portobellos that you guys find in the stores, um, that genus is specific for this odor. That so whenever they have an unpleasant unpleasant odor similar to chemicals, phenol, and sometimes it smells like urine. Uh, it, it'll, it'll usually bruise yellow and that's poisonous. So that's a good indicator for that genus alone. So yeah, that's the only genus that I'm aware of that you would use smell as an indicator. And also a lot of you might have those fun mushroom apps. Don't use them and they make mistakes all the time. And like that white one I showed you, it might've, yeah, or let's say I took a picture of Amanita phylloides. It might've said, oh, that's the go agaricus. Go ahead and eat it. So stay away from apps. Apps are good for a resource to read while you're waiting for the doctor's appointment or, you know, but I wouldn't use it to identify a mushroom, okay, especially if you plan to eat it. So uh, then we have another group, the Rusillas. These are like millions and millions of species of the Rusilla. <laughs> and that can be draining. And splitting gills, they have a brittle flesh. So when you go out and you pick one, and you, it, will, it will snap like a piece of chalk. So, so if I could say something yes. about the rusulas, uh, a cool thing about rusulas, and you'll see this on every species, is you take the cap, you can peel the skin off the top layer of the, the cap, right? So that's another indicator to get it down to species. You'll also have to see if it peels all the way, if it's just halfway, if it's just a little, little bit, if it's very difficult to peel off. That's uh, all indicators to get you the species. Also, if you want to do a spore print for rusulas, they can range from white to pale yellow. So that's another way to kind of get you to species. Most of the time, you'll never get to species with rusulas. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, that's what every, everybody gives up on rusulas. And then another in, in the same family or group is the lactarius, which uh, has this milky secretion. Oh, we got we got a, I a question from online. Okay. What if I heard from a quiet conversation that a company has asked permission to go into the TC rice and strip out two acres? Uh, two acres. Uh, uh, two, two acres, three foot deep of soil because they need to raise their <laughs> <laughs> their children. Yeah. Make the box longer. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> raise their. And the power is at what part of that juice area? 
Okay, sorry about that. Uh, TC Rice and strip out two acres, three foot deep of soil because they need to raise their property higher within a floodplain across town. And the powers that we have to make a decision, what harm would that do to the area and how would that affect the home fork and the Trinity River? Um, I think that would have a strong effect, wouldn't it? Because the uh, endomycorrhizal um, fungi might be stripped. That's it, what happened during the Dust Bowl. It, it's pretty much devastating to the my, my, mycology communities yeah. and anything like that. Uh, to be stripped of three foot deep of land, you're pretty much taking everything that's built up on the soil and inside the soil because fungi isn't really necessarily going to go more than three feet deep. And if you are, it probably won't really build that strong relationship that needs to survive. So if you kind of strip up everything off the ground, then you're pretty much left with nothing. Is it right. possible like transplant that dirt somewhere? It, can it is. So, um, remediation is something like that where you kind of input mycelium in specific areas for it to build up the nutrients in the soil, right? So, that's pretty much um, a good example of micro-remediation. Right. So, yeah, and you can go back to the dust bowl, and, and that's what basically happened. They just stripped all the good fungi, and then the plants couldn't grow anymore. The soil became dirt. So you want to keep soil, you don't want to have dirt. Okay, so back to the Russell groups that upsets everybody. Um, the lactarius lacto, uh, everybody knows that means milk, lactose is milk sugar, and it looks like it bleeds milk, but it's latex. So it's not like oat milk or almond milk. Uh, and, and, and then one thing, people, they'll taste the latex, right? So um, that's another indicator to get you the species with lactarius. You'll have to understand if it's really, uh, if it's bitter or if it's really peppery, spicy, if it burns your tongue, right? Or if it's just mild, there's no flavor at all, right? So these are all indicators to get you the species. Good to know, but I won't be tasting. <laughs> I'll let Sebastian do that. Okay, all right, big group. The folates. Okay, so again, folates are not gilled mushrooms, but you see a lot of them. Um, when I had that anatomy of the mushroom, and I talked, I should have reviewed the pores. Maybe I'll go back to that. So on the underside, this one you can see um, have a porous underside. Okay, soft and fleshy, cat very different from the stem. The tubes produce spores instead of surfaces, spongy with spores. So there are a few that have. Gills, but we won't go there. I know there's exceptions to every rule in every group of mushrooms. Okay, and they're mycorrhizal. So what's one way you would tell it's a mycorrhizal and not a decomposer? Who knows? What's that? It's growing in the dirt and sort of like on the roof. Right, it would be growing just on the dirt or the soil or the ground and not on a tree or bed bark. So let's look in here. Uh, we have a question from online. Oh, can it be sometimes dangerous to smell microscopic fungi and chance that we take the spores into our lungs? Since yes. some microscopic, microscopic fungi like Cryptococcus milformans can cause pneumonia and some immune issues. Yeah, I mean, uh, you've all seen those puffball mushrooms that you just kind of pop and the spores go literally up your nose. That's happened to me and that's kind of scary. You know, you don't want spores in your lungs. So if you're working, um, and I think there are a few people in here on cultivation. We'll come back to you to ask you how you protect yourself. That sort of thing. For the puffballs, there's one disease. It's a respiratory illness. It's called lycoperdonosis. If you breathe in too much of the puffball spores, it can happen to you. It's very rare, but it can become fatal. Um, so don't breathe in too many of the puffball spores. Yeah, just go like that and just move away. <laughs> right. So... Um, and you, how many people have found folates in Texas, in northern Texas? Yay, good chunk. So a lot of people think, oh, we'll never see these in uh, Texas, but guess what? Ah, <laughs> Sebastian <laughs> found these near his house. That's, so don't tell me there's no folates around here. <laughs> that was a bag in my trunk I just found when I was found a mother load of bullies. <laughs> yeah, well, lots of your own, right? <laughs> yeah. So, and, uh, and are these all edible? The, the species you see here in this photo, uh, there's two species. So uh, if, if I could kind of, oh, yeah. everybody can see my mouse here, uh, and I'm going to kind of touch on these. Uh, so this one right here 
if you see, it has brown reticulation. Reticulation is like this netted pattern on the stem, right? And um, always are very famous for having reticulation and you kind of have to pay attention to the reticulation if it's present or not, and that kind of gets you the species. So for this specimen right here, if you see it, it's got brown reticulation. And if you see the one right above it, it doesn't have that at all. You see that? It's kind of hard to tell in this photo. So this one right here is another one that does not have it at all. You see? But then up here, you see the brown reticulation in the middle. So uh, these are two different species found in the same area, and they're both edible. This one's called Boletus luridelis. Luridelis is famous for having the reticulation on the stipe, and um, the one that's adjacent to it is called Pultro Boletus rubicentricus, and that's a big mouthful. Um, and, Rubo means red, right? Um, yeah. The, so um, these blue instantly upon handling, you can kind of see them uh, in the image right there, they're bruising blue. Um, so pretty much as soon as you touch them, no, they're not psychedelic. You know, uh, not all mushrooms that bruise blue are psychedelic. So these are just uh, boletes and they're famous for bru bruising blue. And um, that's kind of how you get to species with some of them. Sometimes when you cut them in half, it's called the context staining. When you cut them in half to see if it bruises on the inside, right? Sometimes you'll see the bruising only on the stem when you cut it inside, or sometimes you'll see it on the fore surface, the tubes, right? So wherever you do see bruising or you don't see bruising, you got to kind of make note of it, right? So that'll help you get to species eventually with these bullets. Are we recording, by the way? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, Fortunately, mushrooms are mostly right? Yes. So she asked if porcinis are bullets, and yes, they are. Porcinis refer to uh, a group called Boletus edulis, right? So they're called the king boletes, right? So pretty much all the porcinis that you see in Italy, right, they are from that family. And they're they're my favorite edibles. So good. Okay, so let's move on. All right, so the good news, even if it's dry out there like it has been, no rain, you're always gonna see what we call polypores. These are in the shelf, some people say bracket mushrooms. Um, they grow, you see them on trees, sometimes on fallen logs. Uh, here's an example of a turkey tail, Carbinus versicolor. And again, ubiquitous, meaning they're found just about everywhere. So even if we go on a foray and there's nothing out there, we're guaranteed, we guarantee you, you'll see a polypore, right? Yeah, That's we, we have some money back. back. <laughs> 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 we money back. We'll, we'll, we'll have to bring some of our own polypores. <laughs> So very diverse group. Some are very leathery, leathery, and the others are like hard piece of wood. You know, try taking it down, I'll try making a spore print out of it. Uh, wood decomposers seen in all seasons. Uh, the spores are in tubes, kind of like with the bolets. So if I can elaborate on the polypores, there, there aren't a lot of poisonous polypores, right? So um, there's nothing that I found in our general vicinity of this North Texas region. Uh, if there are some chemical reactions that you can use, uh, potassium hydroxide, KOH, if you drop that on polypores, it'll turn a beautiful lavender color if it's poisonous. But there's only two species that I know of, and they're in a the genus called the Hapalopulus. That's more of a northeastern type uh, is where the habitat is, so it's not really from Texas. So. Right. And a lot of people are interested in a lot of these polypores because they have medicinal value. And, uh, and also, um, remediation. In, um, in Central Texas, they did a study where they, uh, you know, uh, what's the name of that? Pit, privet, privet tree that causes problems. Well, they cut all the lumber down, but now we have to go back and pick up all the uh, dead logs. But they've been using uh, turkey tail to start decomposing them. So it's really a good idea. Cool. Yeah, it is cool. So, let's go on. Okay, everybody's favorite edibles, chanterelles. I haven't seen any in Texas. Uh, I've seen them in Washington State and California. So um, they're more of a springtime. Yeah. Texas. And probably we'd see them in East Texas, maybe. Or even here in the Oh, even here. Okay. So favorite edible. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later about lookalikes. Just want to make sure it is uh, a chanterelle and not something else. Uh, their bore bearing surfaces occur on the underside of the path 
or on the outer side of the face and range from smooth wrinkle to furrowed. So the <clears throat> wrinkles kind of look like gills, but they're not gills. The, the, the people like to call them veins, right? Because when you look at the middle of it, they're kind of interconnected and they kind of look like uh, the veins in your body, right? So that's why they're called veins. So this, this specific one right here, if you kind of zoom on up. Oh, okay. there you go. So let's see. Yeah. So if you see, it's kind of interconnected right here where it's kind of connecting together. It's very hard to see in this specimen. So, um, other ones right here, you see where it's interconnecting right there. Uh, these, these are all like fame gills, so that's kind of close. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Go back to your <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> Don't touch it. <laughs> okay, so yeah. And again, they're mycorrhizal, so you'll expect to see them growing on the ground. Oh, wait a minute. Let's go back. Oh, no. Oh. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Um, crests and parchment fungi. Uh, these are you see these in the in the forest on logs and that sort of thing. And, and a lot of them look like polypores, but they're not. Uh, they're all saprobes. They're decomposers. So um, they look like polypores, but they don't have a pore. Um, if you take them off, they feel like paper, like a false turkey tail. Spores are reduced by a smooth, hard surface. So we'll come back to all these. I think, uh, how's the timing going? Okay. Uh, then another type, remember we're talking about the other side. Um, here are the toothed mushrooms, uh, the famous one, the lion's mane, which uh, maybe we'll see in a spring foray, or maybe not. <laughs> And the uh, hedgehog fungus, they are mushroom, really pretty, beautiful. It's kind of like the weirdest thing you'll ever see is a lion's mane. It's weird to say. Okay, puffballs are spalls. We were talking a little bit about them. Um, Scaldaccia gigantea. You've seen people holding these giant white puffballs. Um, and uh, again, I, I'm not sure if they're. Uh, they grow here, but they're really cool looking. They have like a marshmallow inside. And again, very diverse group. So just like you have the good puff balls, we have the bad puff balls, like the scleroderma citrinium. It's a, uh, this is the one that I, I took a picture outside of my apartment. So these are everywhere, pig skin, poison puff ball. You wanna uh, keep these away from your pets or kids. Uh, or even people uh, mistakenly thinking they're something like uh, truffles, which of course they're not, but you'd be surprised. They're black in the interior. So basically, whenever you find a puffball, you want to split it in half to see the inside, right? Because sometimes, like she's mentioning right now, this scleroderma right here has a purplish to black interior, right? So whenever you see a puffball, you have to remember the simple rule. If it's all white on the inside, then it's edible, right? If you can get a little bit of yellow is where um, the sporulation starts to occur and then it turns brown, right? Eventually over time. <laughs> Some of these puff balls, depending on the spores, like the, there's a couple in Calvatia that are purple in coloration. So once they reach their uh, life capacity, they pretty much explode and then they'll have like a bunch of little spores everywhere. And you don't really want to breed that in because that's could lead to lycoperdonosis, which I was talking about earlier. Right, so be careful. Okay, and then there's, um, and you notice I, I use a lot of these um, Michael Hugh photographs. He's the mushroom expert guy. He's like my mushroom guru. Uh, the resource will be on the last page, uh, the mushroom expert. So that's where I get a lot of these pictures. Um, so we have the club and the corals, and they look like clubs and corals. Let me see. They're notoriously hard to identify these coral mushrooms because they don't really give us a lot of macroscopic features to work off of, right? So uh, it's ba basically the coloration, and you got to look at the spines on the top tips of the corals. Uh, if you go back. Oh, yeah. So uh, if you see the spines right here, uh, that's kind of uh, what you want to look at. Also, the overall, uh, 
how dense the cluster is, right? So if, if it's just like uh, smashed in there and you can't even see through it, or if it's just barely a, a few of these kind of sticking out, you see how it's got like this own specimen right here. So pretty much, um, they're very notoriously hard to identify the species. Um, if you want to eat them, you have to taste them to see if they're bitter. And if they're not bitter, then you can eat them. That's for corals only and some lactarius and rusulas. And you can see it's okay. So next group, uh, stink horns. Many of you have found stink horns in your neighborhood. Um, spores, mass, slimy, smells like carrion or dung. <laughs> Insects love this. And probably your dogs too, too. So be careful. Um, I don't think they harm you, but um, beetles are attracted to stink horns. They're all saprobes, so they decompose. Uh, this one was at a friend's house in Thailand. Uh, and, and insects are very important in the spore dispersal of these, uh, all the stink horns, because when they become attracted to the stink, right, they are they land on top of the head right here, uh, and then uh, pretty much it's called a gleba, which is this green coloration that you see on the head, and that can pretty much stick to the insect, and whenever the insect flies away or scurries wherever they want to, they're releasing spores. And whenever conditions are right, the mushroom will fruit again. So that's pretty much how the uh, life cycle is. Yeah. Continues. Oh, oops. Let's go back to jellies. Okay, jellies, another group um, that you might see in the forest. Uh, you'll see them better when it's moist. They tend to be gelatinous or rubber like, uh, can dry out, can be rehydrated. Uh, not poisonous, but no real taste. Some people eat it in their hot and sour soup. Um, it doesn't taste like anything to me. Uh, this covers a variety of fungi that share the gelatinous texture characteristics. So uh, some of these might be in a totally different class or phylum or you know, genus. And they're best identified with a microscope. We're hoping that in the near future, uh, Sebastian will do a class on microscopy. So, um, we're going to have uh, first nest fungi. Uh, this looks like something out of a Tim Burton uh, movie. Yeah, like evil black eggs. <laughs> That's creepy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is a bird's nest. And we actually found this when we had our first, first board meeting outside of a restaurant in Capel. Uh, and, and so when you see these bird nests, they, they kind of have a closed top to them. And whenever that top opens up like the Cowboy Stadium, uh, the rain will fall. And then when the rain falls, it hits these little eggs, which the eggs will then disperse the spores. And kind of like how I was talking about earlier with the stink horns, it's starting the life cycle again. So rain is very important for fungi in general. <laughs> right. Why do we want it? rain? <laughs> so, okay. So we covered a lot of the best, you know, mycotas. Now we're going to look at some of the escomycetes, uh, another major group that we're going to look at, because these are incredibly visible. You know, a lot of them are not, but a few are. Uh, Sarcomycetes cerveciae, the famous brewer's yeast, uh, really important in the food industry. Uh, life wouldn't be worth living if you didn't have these guys, because I love bread and wine, beer, and all that good yeah. stuff. So, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> Wouldn't be fun. It'd be miserable. It'd be miserable, yeah. <laughs> Very diverse group again. Diverse word. 75% of mushrooms are ascomycetes. B cells first carry out to have its genome sequenced. And this all led to the human genome project. So when they were able to sequence yeast, then they moved on to humans. Uh, includes yeast, moles, cups, saddles, morals, the zombie like cordyceps, dead shell disease, dead man's fingers, truffles. So you have the good, the bad, and the ugly all in one. Cups and saddles, uh, cups, scores kept in inner surface, saddles look like cups, but they have a little stock. So uh, anything interesting about these guys? The Helbellas. So uh, Helbella is this one on the right. Um, they're, they're pretty much very variable uh, in their actual look to them. They, they can come with a little stem attached at the bottom to where it's barely even noticeable, or they'll have these very defined uh, vein-like almost um, stipes with 
uh, is present here. Um, they kind of have this weird looking cap to them. They don't really have any gills, right? So when you look at the underside, it's very smooth um, and they're mycorrhizal. So you'll find them next to trees. And then finally, laurels, Morchella squata, favorite animal, but watch out for lookalikes. There's only one that can be a lookalike, that crane. The, the burpa. Yeah, but that doesn't look like any of that to me. But uh, these are morals, very expensive, you know, uh, very tasty. So, and we're hoping that in the spring, we're setting up a foray and we're going to be looking for uh, morals. So, really cool looking too. I mean, you know what this is by looking at it. And, and they're also notoriously hard to get to species as well because they're very, um, they don't really have a lot of macroscopic features for us to kind of look at. But when you kind of go back to this one, a lot of them just have this drab brown coloration to it, right? And they kind of have these really deep pits where you see in the inside right here. Um, and the, they look like species. Uh, there's one called Burpa. Bohemica, the entire genus of Burpa, kind of looks like Morchella, but when you uh, look at the bottom of it, Morchella has an attached cap, and Burpa, it has a cap that's kind of hanging off like a skirt, okay, so that's pretty much how you tell the differences there. And then there's another genus called Gyromitra, which has a lot of lookalikes, but they're not really brownish coloration like that. They don't have the same pits as the morels do, they're more uh, solid. Right. Yes, Stacy. And um, so, morels are like hollow. Yes. Um, on the inside, if you put them in mask, are the purpose also hollow? Yes, they are also hollow. So, uh, gyrometras, they're solid. Um, so, when you cut them in half, they won't be hollow, like Stacy said, the Marcellas are. Uh, that's a really good indicator whenever you're looking for them. So, just look out for hollow morels. And that's why I don't want to use those apps where you take a picture of it. Yeah, stay away from those, except for. You know, Hey, truffles, everybody's favorite, most expensive uh, mushrooms. The fruiting body of the subterranean Ascomycetes fungus, uh, predominantly one of the many species of the genus tuber. Uh, white and black truffles are prized edibles, very expensive. Uh, in addition to tuber, many other genera of fungi are classified as truffles. We have pecan truffles here in Texas, truffle lime. No, uh, lime so we have to, yeah, we have to look for uh, pecan uh, plantations to see if we can find truffles. And sure enough, truffles are, because they're subterranean, you have to use animals to look for them. It's not a good idea to rake. Some people rake, but that's not good for the soil, of course. So dogs and pigs have been used for hunting uh, truffles. Uh, pigs are really good, but they tend to want to eat the truffles, so it's best to use dogs. And uh, this is my dog, Vincy. Uh, we're working on scent right now. She's scenting birch, and we're going to start another odor. But I also have the uh, truffle oil, so I want to get her to find truffles. So then we have to go to Oregon at this point. We have a question from online. It's, yeah. uh, it says, I see people talking a lot about doing spore prints to verify identification. Can you do spore prints on all these mushrooms that we've seen, or are there mushrooms that spore prints can't be done on? Okay, we're going to get to spore prints towards the how to identify part. So hold that question and we'll come back to it. So, okay, so dogs and pigs. Um, in Europe, dogs that can find truffles are highly prized, and it's very, uh, it's very cruel. Sometimes uh, a competitor will kill or poison a competitor's dog so that they get off the truck. So there's a lot of politics in Europe. Okay, so now to the part where you all want to, how do I identify mushrooms? Okay, so uh, again, start by getting familiar with all the mushroom guides you can get a hold of. If you can get a hold of that Texas guy, the $300, that's good. Have your Audubon, have your Gulf Coast, I also use David Aurora's um, mushroom uh, book, but he's most of his stuff is for California and the West Coast, and it's black and white. <laughs> That's not fun. Uh, stay away from mushroom maps. Keep on repeating that. In the field note, where uh, so when you go out mushroom hunting and you find a group of mushrooms, first thing you want to know is it growing on soil or is it on wood? Because that will tell you whether it's mycorrhizal or a decomposer. 
So that's important when you get to your notes. Um, and I think I passed around that one book that shows you all the, there you go. Did everybody have a chance? Sorry about that. This has all the identification points. Has, have you all had a chance to look at these? Okay, so do that in front for later. Um, so another important thing to know, what, what season is it? Springtime, is it winter? You know, what's the weather like? Is it really cold, really hot? Is it rainy? You know, it's a lot of moisture, humid. Um, another important thing you need to identify is what species of tree or plant is it growing next to? That's really key. Um, and we, we really need to know how to identify trees in order to be a really good citizen mycologist. Mushrooms can be very specific about the tree it works with or decomposes. Okay, another thing you want to look at is how numerous is it? Is it one single mushroom in the whole field or are they all bunched together? Like this, this mycospeak is cespitose. Okay, so that means clustered together. Um, are they in troops? Are they fairy rays? These are all things you have to write down in your journal. Uh, shape of cap and stem if present. Again, something like this goes over all the different shapes and whether it, the cap is attached. You know, the gills are attached or not attached. Uh, here's a handy guide we were passing that around, and this has all the uh, features. You can take that book with you when you go to identify. I'd rather write down in a notebook and then go back and you can go home and say, oh, what was the shape of that? You know, and some of these terms are really confusing. I still have problems knowing what all these are. I'm getting there. Okay. So how do I identify continue? Uh, so again, we just mentioned, are the gills attached, not attached? Is there a universal veil? Is a vulva present large? Are, these, are there patches above? Like in the muscaria, you have little patches. Um, how is it colored? Color can be subjective. So Sebastian may call this brown, I might call it orange. So again, be careful with color and you know, that sort of thing. Texture, is it scaly? Is it this viscid or slimy? Is it reticulate? Netted pattern that you saw earlier in the uh, bullets or fibrolose? Uh, what happens when you cut or bruise it? Does it turn purple, pink, yellow? Does it bleed milk? Okay. So those are all things you have to dig in and start cutting and slicing. Uh, continued smell. Many mushrooms, as we mentioned, as on mentioned earlier, have a distinct odor, such as cinnamon, fishy, apricots, garlic, bleach, or dead corpus like stink horns. Uh, truffle oil has a really distinctive smell, uh, which is good because if you're training your dog, that's really <laughs> strong. It's overpowering. So, uh, taste not recommended except for the experts. And you will break a piece, taste it, and spit it out. Uh, I'm not there yet. <laughs> So um, I think Sebastian's definitely there. Yeah, yeah. it's very important that you taste test all your mushrooms whenever you want to identify one that you can't identify. So if it's very bitter, if it's spicy, if it doesn't have any taste, you know, you kind of need to make note of this because ever so often you'll find one that's like really spicy and that's the key indicator for the species, right? So you won't ever get to the species unless you taste it. You gotta don't like spit out whatever you taste. If you accidentally swallow just a little bit, it won't kill you. Even if it's a deadly mushroom, you have to consume a decent amount of the fungus for it to have adverse side effects. All right. So be very, very careful. In other words, if you're not, you're not certain. I, I don't know. I don't go there. But yeah. Um, capture with a camera. Now a lot of you post. Really nice photographs on Facebook, which is good, so to help us identify. But make sure you get a good picture of the gills or the underside, if it's a porous one, the stems. Uh, what substrate was it found? Was it found in soil or on a piece of log? <clears throat> and if you can, show us the size or scale. You know, maybe put a penny or a pen or a telephone or a mobile phone or something. So we know. I have a little measuring stick too. Use iNaturalist to send. Uh, iNaturalist, um, how many of you use the iNaturalist? It's a great app to have. You take a picture, you send it in, 
hopefully uh, a really expert mycologist will look at that picture and say, yeah, that's what it is. Okay. But again, you don't want to use it to say, oh, it's edible. Because okay. not everybody on iNatural is an expert. You know, like I go there a lot for bird identification. And some people call it a different type of bird than I know it is. So be careful with that. Uh, same with Facebook. How do I know if I continue? Now, normally I was going to take you directly to that link so we can go step by step, but we have internet issues and I want to keep it so it's super But you can go on this later. It's fun. Uh, bring a sample home in a paper bag or a basket. You make a spore print, it's easy and fun. Uh, so basically, you just cut the cap away and you put it on. I use aluminum foil, but you put on white paper, black paper. Aluminum foil is good because if it's a white score, then it, it'll be hard to see it. So uh, if you go on NAMA's website, uh, which you have a link for, NAMA is a North American Mycological Association. How many of you are members? Oh, good. Okay. If you want to join that big group, uh, you are an affiliate, you're in an affiliated club. So you get what ten dollars off? Yeah, yeah. The, the normal fee is thirty-five dollars to join NAMA, and you know uh, they host this fantastic foray every year. Last year I was in Colorado, and the foray is about three and a half, four days long. Uh, they'll pick a location. Uh, the foray includes the hotel, food, and uh, they have forays every day. They bring in mycologists to have lectures on the most recent advances in mycology or whatever their respective fields are. Last year, uh, there was a hematomanita, which is the deadliest genus of mushrooms. Um, there was a, a pretty much a lecture on how the toxins in amanita were formed last year. And a lot of different lectures that I missed that I didn't get to attend because I was out pouring. <laughs> but uh, it's very fun and I suggest everybody go to at least one in their lifetime if you haven't been to it because it's not only is it informative but you get to meet all these really cool people from across america that are doing really cool things in my college so if you're really interested in that stuff check it out right <laughs> so so um yeah so once you have your spore print note the color of the spore and you go on that facebook group yeah i found this mushroom it has a white it has a brown it has a pink spore so that that helps people like sebastian identify it very important identification, microscopic features. Uh, earlier, he mentioned something about using uh, potassium hydroxide or called melts, melters. No, that's something else. Oh, that's something else. Okay, or liberals. Uh, use reagents. You can order these reagents online, and maybe our club will order some. But uh, to note the reaction, uh, you can. Like the mushroom expert guy, which is on the resources, he uses a lot of these reagents to finally get down to species. You can even send the sample for DNA sequencing. Okay, now that's kind of costly, but if you're really obsessed with nobody knows what this is, you can do that. Yes. So the spore print, is it the same within the genus or is it different by the species? Be different species, correct? Uh, so I remember asked if the spore print would vary by genus, right? So uh, the color of the spores are all the same within every genus, right? So uh, if one species in that genus has black spores and the other spores will be black as well. Oh, that genus. That's good to know. Okay, so, and that's knowing how to make a spore print is another way to identify finally. Yes? Are there any concerns mentions about if you like mushrooms and spore print? If it's a really burnt mushroom, you can wipe out this one mushroom that's grown in California. Well, the, uh, the good news about that is when you destroy the spore, you know, when you remove it, it's best if it's the only one, it's best to leave one or two around. But uh, you're going to spread spores in the way. Yeah. So, good. Uh, so, a member asked if, if we just remove the one and only specimen that we find, <laughs> and if it happened to be an ultra rare species that was never found before in Texas. So, um, to touch on that point, uh, we would love to remove that one species because we'd love to dry it out and save it for future generations to have uh, to study, right? And as Ava kind of touched on, when you pull up a mushroom, it's spreading spores everywhere, right? So 
a lot of times you'll see mushroom hunters, they have a basket uh, or something for us to where the spores will even fall out as they're kind of traversing through the woods, right? So we're pretty much walking insects that are dispersing spores because we love mushrooms. <laughs> right. So it's, it really helps in uh, dispersing the spores so as many uh, opportunities arise as possible for the food body to pop up at the time. Right. That's a good question. Uh, I was going to touch on that earlier. Um, so with certain genre, especially with these darker sport mushrooms, you'll find specimens that are completely sterile, right? So you'll go to put a cap on paper or foil or what have you, and you wait an hour and nothing comes out of it, right? So uh, you're looking at it like, did I do something wrong? You know, you start to get aggravated, but some mushrooms, they won't ever produce spores. Um, and if we can touch on this question as well, I think we could tie both in. It says, I see people talking a lot about doing spore prints and verify identification. Can you do spore prints on all these mushrooms that we've seen? Or are there mushrooms that spore prints can't be done on? So spore prints can't be done on, let's say the Ophiocordyceps, right? The cordyceps mushrooms are the ones that pop out of the insect body, right? Because how are you gonna put the insect? I mean, I guess you can flip it upside down and try to collect spores, but basically what you wanna do when you find one of those is, uh, they have these little holes called periodols, right? And, and that's where the spores pop out of. And if you kind of pretty much scrape, uh, if you have like a forcep or tweezers or whatever, if you can scrape that area, because a lot of them have spines or something that projects out of the fruit body, right? So um, when you see that projection, you want to go towards the end of it and kind of just scrape off whatever spore material is left, because whenever spores are shooting out of that hole, they'll always have residual spores around the area where it's kind of shooting out, of, right? So a lot of mushrooms like um, the hypogeus fungi, the ones that are found subterraneously, right? So you can't really get a spore print from a, a ball, right? Like how are you gonna get a spore print from that, right? So those are a lot more difficult to get spores from. And um, a lot of times you'll have to cut them, you know, and have actually dissect into the specimens to try to find yeah, so that's made a lot of cultivation challenging for cordyceps and especially right. truffle. Truffle uh, in New Zealand, they're trying to start uh, European truffles, and that's been quite a challenge. So, the proper soil and trees. Oops. Oh, where are you going? Uh, there's it's, another question about truffles. You want oh. to touch on it now? Or? Oh, yeah. Uh, speaking of truffles. Okay. So, what's the question? Let's see. Uh, it says, Speaking, speaking of truffle hunting, uh, is there a place we can print off a worksheet like this? So uh -oh. let's see what this uh -oh. worksheet is. Uh, yeah, 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 we don't want to go there. We don't want to go there. We don't want to go there because we're going to lose it. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's Are there some mushrooms that require like spores from two different mushrooms touching them in something? Yeah. They all just produce like asexual ones. Yeah. So, and then the key with, oh, let's just see if they your audio. So, um, I hope they can see. Uh, so, yeah, there's a really good, there's a new movie. I think that's where it led to. It's called Pig. <laughs> it's about this guy who loses his truffle pig in a while. Yeah, it's that actor. What's his name? Nicholas Cage. Nicholas Cage. <laughs> so there's a lot of emotion and drama. It's Nicholas Cage. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I can't think of anything worse. Yeah. Yeah. If you get the truffle, can you inoculate like uh, the pecan tree, for instance, yeah. to get more truffle from it? Right. Yeah. Inoculate it. So, yeah, that's so. That's so it, it takes a long time for the mycorrhizal relationship to develop, right? So, uh, with pine trees, there's a, a genus of fungi called Rhizopogon, right? And these are truffle like species that are found almost, they barely pop out of the ground. You know, sometimes I have the duff just covering it. And these are necessary for the tree to grow, right? So, pine trees can't grow without this little Rhizopogon truffle. And they share a symbiotic relationship that whenever people are going to plant 
lines, they have to make sure that Rizzo Pokemons are with it, right? Or else they won't even grow. So um, another point uh, that you're saying is the mycorrhizal relationship takes about anywhere from nine months to two years for them to develop. So uh, it is possible to inoculate the palm trees and try to grow, but nobody's really successfully done it yet. So. Right. And they're trying. <laughs> right now the program is they're trying. But, oh, um, you uh, get rid of that. So and oh, we'll, we'll back, back, back. So the, we'll back, 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 back. Okay. So the key to really learning mushrooms is actually going out in quarries because you can read these books and look at pictures all you want, but unless you go out there and touch it, feel it, see it, uh, you're not going to learn it. Okay. So it's easier to go on as many quarries as possible to learn how to identify. That's the key. Because when you go out there, these pictures on the Audubon uh, book. They're really beautiful, but when you go out there, the mushrooms don't look like that. Those are, you know, our fashion photographs. <laughs> Wait, we have one more question. Oh. It says, opinions on spore prints and cloning. Which one is better or the benefits and drawbacks? I don't know if that's a good question. Uh, I, I really don't really understand it because spore prints, you're just getting the spore coloration for the actual print from the mushroom. With uh, cloning or culturing, you're actually taking a specimen, a little piece of the specimen, putting it in a plate and you're growing it. So you're actually starting cultivation, right? So you, you, you can grab a spore print, kind of scrape it off into the plate, right? And that'll start what you need to kind of get your agar or whatever you're using for your culture to take off. But there are two different things, right? So uh, using cloning or culturing is uh, completely different from just a spore print. A spore print will just tell you the coloration or give you an actual copy of the spore print. And we're going to have a cloning class coming up too, if you're really into that too. Okay, so let's go to the next. All right, so after you learn how to identify and all that, you should also be aware of the really bad poisonous ones. I don't want to click on this because we're going to lose the Zoom people. <laughs> Sorry for calling you the Zoom people. But anyway, uh, so try not to, don't eat wild mushrooms unless you are beyond a doubt, you know what it is, <coughs> even if it looks very edible. Um, this one's Amanita phylloides. Okay, the really dangerous death cap. This is the one you want to avoid. If you, when you go home, you can uh, go to this website um, right here, and it will take you how do I ex um, specifically identify this species of Amanita. And uh, really important for people from uh, countries where it's common to eat all sorts of white gilled mushrooms. So people from Asia, Eastern Europe. I have some Russian friends every spring they get in their van and they go to Colorado and they eat everything. Even white gilled ones. Like, we, we eat everything. <laughs> so um, yeah, so go through this and you know, when you have time and- uh, if, if, if I could say something about the Hemineal Floydes, it's actually an invasive species and it's the actual reach is growing. So uh, because of its mycorrhizal nature, uh, it's actually becoming uh, more widespread in America. So uh, in places that it wasn't like 10 years ago, it's being found now. So uh, and a part of that is due to humans and how we kind of just bring everything with us everywhere, right? So, if, um, and then I also heard about this case where there's this company in Australia and they were producing mulch, right? So. Uh, the spores were inside the mulch and they were sending bags across the world, right? So they would send them to South America, to Europe, and eventually uh, the fungus that was, in the spore, that was in the mulch bags became invasive to these other countries. And now it's pretty much rampant all around the world. Yeah. Yeah. As you were walking in here, probably had, you're covered with spores. So I just asked a quick question about that. So what's the danger of an invasive species of mushroom? I fully understand invasive species of plants. So invasive mushrooms, um, they're totally different from plants because you know they don't really stick around as long as plants do. And uh, they can become problematic for some people because, okay, well, uh, what are we gonna have like all these deadly mushrooms that are <laughs> you know, in front of my lawn and I've got kids or Dog. dogs or what have you you know, running around. And um, other than that, they don't really... Uh, they, can they displace anything? No, they, they, they don't really take over the ecology as much of a... It's not like, like an impact that yeah. like plants do. They don't really, 
because of their temporary nature. They don't really have a, a big, strong presence that kind of wipes out everything else. So, and supposedly they've been reported in East Texas. Thank you <laughs> of this actual dangerous question. So, are there some mushrooms that have like adapted to grow in like weaker soil? Um, that, that kind of helps them become more. So, so the question was the. Uh, were there any mushrooms that grow to adapt in this kind of soil, that loose soil? So mushrooms are very, uh, they know how to evolve, right? To kind of fit with their environment, right? So pretty much what I like to say is mushrooms don't follow rules, right? Or boundaries. So whatever we kind of say that this mushroom does, it always likes to surprise us, right? So you'll find mushrooms growing in your house if you have like, <laughs> <laughs> some wood that is on your wall. I've seen this in the mushroom ID forums where people, they got like- What is this mold? That, yeah. They got all these <laughs> mushrooms going in their bathroom and I'm like- <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh, we have a question on this. What far do you think that you do live in East Texas on property? Like, does it help to like pick on the magnum to eradicate it? Or... You won't be able to get rid of the problem. You might even be spreading it. The, the, the spores are actually in the soil, into the roots of the trees. So that's kind of where you would have to attack. And if you don't want to get rid of your trees, <laughs> I don't see a lot of people don't want to get rid of the trees. But you do want to get rid of it if you have a dog or something out there. Yeah. So, you know, for yeah. now, you know, but keep an eye. Just train the dog not to eat mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So it's really important to, uh, to keep an eye on these guys. Uh -huh. Oh, 30 minute mark. Okay. So it's good. We're heading towards 30 minutes. Um, as you notice, this is a change in culture. Um, a lot of, of us grew up thinking that all mushrooms, toad stool, stools are dangerous uh, and don't touch mushrooms. And that's all part of Western culture. So we had a lot of mycophobia. Uh, nowadays, we're, we're slowly becoming more mycophilia type culture where we're starting to appreciate enjoy mushrooms, not fear them. Uh, England, the United States is notorious for being afraid of mushrooms. Eastern European people, they've been hunting mushrooms. And in China, mushrooms have been used and hunted for 5,000 years. Um, this is a picture I took at Central Market. They're now growing their own mushrooms, but still selling them for a hefty price. <laughs> yeah, so that'll never stop. Um, and <coughs> You even see it in stores. This is and uh, anthropology. I went in there. I actually told her, "Can I have those when you're done?" And she goes, "Well, write down your name, and I'll talk to the manager." And I never heard that. <laughs> I said it would be for educational purposes. They didn't do a really good job, anyway. It's really <laughs> bad. It's a very bad mushroom. I didn't want to mention anything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't even know where to start. I go, "Oh, these are the most jealous." What central? <laughs> Oh, Central Market on Preston and Royal. Mm. Yeah, yeah, they have a whole container. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Michaelia continues. See more celebrations and events happening. This is from Telluride. Uh, I've never been, but I heard it's a lot of fun. And they have all the different types of mushrooms, the kind amazing. that you like to take in the privacy of your own home. <laughs> 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 so that's. There's that, that aspect to it too. There's a lot of people looking for that sort of thing. And on our Facebook group, we absolutely do not allow any mention of psychedelic mushrooms. Well, I mean, you can post your psychedelic mushrooms to find out on the wild, right? I'll post the ones that you go in your closet. We don't, <laughs> we don't want to know about those because Facebook is watching you. So they know where you live. So, <laughs> so yeah, and there's a growing uh, respect for mushrooms, uh, a growing respect for indigenous cultures that have been using mushrooms for thousands of years. We need to go back and learn more about them. You know, go to the Amazon, hang out with the Yamamani people and find out more about their. Uh, certainly, we're learning a lot about plants, as you mentioned, like uh, that are helpful. Uh, science fiction, fantasy literature about mushrooms is getting more and more popular. Those are usually on the darker side. There's a game, I forget the name of it, where people are all zombies. The last, the last of us, yeah, that's it, yeah. So, um, yeah. So there's a realization fungi are extremely beneficial. Uh, 
those of you who have seen Fantastic Fungi, Paul Stamets gets up there and he says, you know, fungi are going to save the world, save the planet. So, and he's, he's a little bit controversial in the whole mycology uh, community because people think he's taking advantage. Yeah, well, spending, you know. people, people think that he's uh, spitting out false uh, claims yeah. of how mushrooms certain mushrooms will heal cancer and that's kind of like big, down, uh, <laughs> big no, no. that's a big statement to make because people are going to be like oh my god this heals cancer and then they're going to go and put all their money or life savings into getting like, treatments right. for it and nothing works and then they die and, yeah and i mean he, he even used his mother and, you know she you know was saved by the turkey tail but, right but she was out, she was probably on chemotherapy. As well. it, it, there's not enough uh, actual study to be performed and kind of analyzed to say whether it is definitively or not. So it's pretty much the same thing as drinking snake uh, venom. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So I mean, he's he's a great you know uh, speaker and all that, but you know he his studies or his findings still need to be uh, you know scientifically studied and proven. So we need to use the scientific method. Um, so let's see. Oh, so again, I mentioned the best way to learn about mushrooms is to go on forays, you know, and uh, this is the one we took uh, in Arlington. Yeah, River Legacy. This was our Legacy. Texas Star celebration. Yeah. And in case there was zombie trouble, you can see we have two dogs. <laughs> so, and everybody's carrying a stick. <laughs> <laughs> that looks like the new uh, yeah, zombie thing. But, uh, and let's see, go with the next one, I think, resources. So this is on your, and sorry, you can't click on the links, but you can at least, you know, um, <clears throat> go through all these. And uh, somebody was asking if I could make a, a copy of um, this handout. So well, I think for educational purposes, I might Yeah, that, that would be pretty cool to have. And right. I, I think we could pass them out at 4 a.m. So. Yeah, I think so. I think it would be helpful. So we'll, we'll get out working on that. So give us a couple weeks. <laughs> so, and my, like I said, my favorite resource is Mushroom Expert. Uh, this Mushroom World. There's the North American Mycological Association. That's where the spore prints came from. Um, WikiHow is where I got the Identify Death Cap. Uh, Spot Earth. We could try to click on that since, well, we don't want to lose this. Okay, okay we can click on it. Well, we'll see what happens. But it's really cool. And they said for educational reasons, we can use their video. I actually have to talk to them. So let's see if we go there. Hopefully, we won't lose anybody. It's fun. Oh, yeah, here it goes. Protect uh, the underground network. <clears throat> so that's a really good organization, uh, mycelium around the world. They're, they're working on it. And I don't know how they do that. Maybe some sort of isotope or photography. So I'm trying to find it. It's pretty intense to kind of go network of mycelium. I'm not sure if Edwin kind of grasped the idea of that. Mycelium, I mean, it, we've got more miles of mycelium on planet Earth than we do stretching to the sun, right? So it's for us to kind of map that out would be almost impossible. I'm glad somebody's taking it. Yeah, taking that <laughs> off. We connect with them. Like if you live in uh, like Argentina or something, you can start at the ground networks uh, and uh, the question earlier about fungi being invasive um yeah if it weren't for fungi we wouldn't be here because remember they're the first ones to land it on uh, land so, all right so now we're open to questions so if i can't have the questions sebastian's also an expert and my colleagues <laughs> what about like forest fires comments like is it the carbon that they create but yeah, that's what <clears throat> after fire is for else. So uh, that's a good question you just brought up. Um, I didn't hear the entire part of it, but there is a good website uh, called Modern Forager, Modern Dash Forager. And um, he, the guy that runs it, his name is Trent Blizzard. Uh, he's the current president of NAMA, the North American Mycological Association. Uh, what he does which is pretty fantastic to me. He goes and studies burn locations on maps from the entire United States. And he'll go to those locations once he studies the topography because he'll look at the trees, he'll look at um, which way the slope on the mountain is facing, right? So if you're on the mountain, you wanna pretty much get the slope that's uh, 
facing away from the sun because it's barely getting any of the heat and exposure from the rays, right? So it still has a little bit of the light, but it's enough to get uh, sufficient uh, growth from the morels. And whenever there's a fire, it kind of um, pretty much destroys everything and returns all that to the soil. And that nutrient is then pretty much like miracle growth for the morels, right? So that's when they kind of get activated. They're like, oh, we're, we're all excited. And then they start to consume the nutrients that were kind of ravaged by the fire. And that's why burn morels are produced in such high yields that people that actually sell morels, they'll just focus on these burned locations because trying to find them regularly is very difficult and you won't have as much success. So, so I hope I answered your question. Yeah. <laughs> California has that big problem because of all the forest fires. Yeah. So any other questions also from the people on Zoom? Pine piles love turned brown. Oh, yep, that's true. Pyro means fire and piles. Yeah, so pyrophilus fungi is fungi that are born from fire, right? So uh, go ahead. I was just going to ask, do y'all have resources as far as like um, buying bulk supplies for cultivation? Like the yeah, substrate? We have we have sponsors. Um, yeah, Texas uh, our, our, our sponsor from Texas Mycology, Chase Jennings down south. Uh, he has. Uh, if you're a member, you should have received uh, fifteen percent off uh, coupon code for them when you signed up. Or because uh, we just implemented the emails about two weeks ago, so yeah. so you should have send, gotten the code. We had to send out the manual uh, code to about fifty-ish people. So if you never got it, please check with us. Uh, it gives you 15% off to Texas Mycology, which is a big supplier for all things cultivation related. And, um, you know, we don't have anything in house ourselves. So we're just pretty much going off of our sponsors. So we're directing all of our traffic to them. Yeah, 15% so off is good. If, deal. If, if, if you go on our website, you'll see their name uh, at the bottom for sponsors. You'll see it next to Texas Fungus, which is a cultivator in Arlington that grows dormant mushrooms. You'll see. Texas Mycology, which is a supplier for cultivation. So, any other questions? If you have a strict genetic oh. line for asexual reproduction, how do you get the variations and evolution that you're talking about? That's a good question. Well, that's a good question. Again, there's also always random <coughs> mutation. So, um, you know, something might have random mutation and, and look differently eventually. Has anybody done like gene splicing with mushrooms? Um, I don't think we're there yet, but I'm sure somebody's doing gene splicing with mushrooms because we, we, you know, wouldn't it be nice if there was a mushroom that decomposed plastic? We could take that gene maybe, or I know bacteria do it, so maybe we'll take the gene from the bacteria and put it in. They're, they're using oysters to decompose plastic and yeah. trash and all that stuff now, so it's pretty cool that the recent advancements are making. Yeah, so one of these days we will probably get genetic engineering. Uh, it might even be happening right now, quietly. <laughs> we don't know. DARPA. <laughs> anyway, but uh, I think there was a question over there. Oh, same thing. Yeah. So that's a good question. Would they still be edible after that? Like after eating the plants? Oh, yeah. That's the, the cool part. So uh, she mentioned earlier that mushrooms digest and then ingest, as opposed to us, we ingest and digest, mm -hmm. right? So um, what, what that means is, they break down whatever they're feeding on first and then digest the nutrients. So you're not getting any of the toxic compounds that are within the substrate. Right. Questions, Stacey? Yeah, um, so I'm gonna start with the last question. Um, what is I think, yeah, I think there would be variations. So the spores that will have like variations in sizes, right? So well, whenever, like, um, the, I don't know, the inside, like, the spores, like, not exactly the same. Right. right. Yeah, they're not exactly close, <laughs> you know. But, I mean, I that's what you call it. Because mm -hmm. yeah. if you, like, take a piece of the mushroom, you are making, like, a replica of the that one. one. Yeah. Right. Right. So oyster A score might be different than oyster B. Right. So we have some questions from online. Let's see. But can each mushroom be identified by the hyphae or mycelium using a microscope? 
Uh, that, that's a no because uh, there is not enough micro, uh, micro, microscopic, <laughs> yeah. microscopic uh, details there in the hyphae or the mycelium for us to make a definitive call with it's this species or this species. That's why whenever we're looking at spores, we want to look at the spore size, the spore ornamentation. That means uh, what, what is the texture of the spore? Does it have um, these little balls or does it have uh, pretty much, is it uh, spiked out, you know, like what is the shape, right? So all of these, you don't really see when you're looking at mycelium right? or a hyphae under the microscope because they all kind of look the same. So, and then the next one is, uh, how do they decompose plastic exactly? Well, I don't know the exact uh, type of enzymes they use, if that's the question, because they expel enzymes in order to digest. So I imagine it's, that's the sort of thing, uh, but yeah, they'll still eat it like you would eat a sandwich, I guess, outside digestion. So it depends that uh, they need to have specific enzymes that will break down plastic, just like any specific lactase to break down milk from uh, sugars, right? So some of you don't have that lactose sugar, so you can't break down the milk. So I imagine other mushrooms that can't break plastic don't have the correct enzymes. Okay, and this one says, I heard that the increased use of chaga is leading to a shortage. What can we do to further raise awareness about conservation as well? Maybe we as a group can raise awareness about that too. So uh, chaga, for those of you that don't know, is a very medicinal mushroom. It's found north of here. It's pretty much never found in Texas because we don't have the cold uh, climate that it needs to thrive. Um, so it is very difficult to reproduce. Um, so that's why it's kind of leading to a shortage. Um, people go out there in mass and try to find this fungus and They've been selling it online and it's been pretty much uh, causing uh, havoc for everybody else that are just trying to find it for recreational purposes or medicinal purposes, right? Um, and so basically here in Texas, I don't really see us making a big impact because we don't need it here, right? So, I mean, we could start awareness about it, but I mean, if we're not in the general area where it grows, then how are we going to try to protect it? Yeah, if we were in Canada or Alaska. But, but there's like a line, and it's somewhere in the, I think it's above like uh, Colorado, and that's pretty much, it goes into Canada, and that's where um, chaga is found. Right. So I, I guess cultivators, have they started cultivating chaga? Uh, is that I, I haven't seen I think that would be hard. So any other oh, question back there? Right, because there is a lot of snake oil stuff yeah. out there. You know, so, like so, if I could touch on that point. Um, a lot of these mushrooms that you'll find in these supplements, right? You have to look at what it was grown on, right? You want to find the mushroom that's grown on the specific host tree that it prefers, right? They want to oh, know what the question. Oh, oh. What was the question? Oh, oh, yeah. oh I was asked to repeat it. So basically, uh, a member asked if uh, what can we look for within these supplements to make sure that they're getting what they are really wanting to buy, right? If they're getting the actual bang for their buck, right? So. A lot of these um, co companies, they'll use myceliated oats or they'll use whatever else kind of grains that they can to grow these medicinal fungi. And they don't have the same properties, medicinal properties that other fungi that are found in the wild that grow on their specific host trees have, right? So basically whenever you do find any of these supplements, look at the back, see what it says on the ingredients list. It says myceliated oats or anything like that. You don't really want to get it because it's not really as medicinal as the actual specimen found on the tree itself. And that's what Paul Simons is kind of controversial yeah. because he uses brown rice. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, you know, if you want lion's mane, get it from the tree. Don't don't get it from the yeah, powder. Oh, another question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
see, uh, the unfortunate thing about these commercial producers is that they're looking to cut corners, right? So uh, they're looking to cut production time. They're looking to get the maximum yield they can from each uh, harvest, right? So during that process, uh, they can cut corners that causes the mushroom to lose medicinal value, right? So if they're not growing it on the right things, like it should be going on like, for example, Ganoderma can lose medicinal value if it's not found on specific trees that it's grown on, right? Because, um, and you'll see a lot of the Ganoderma lucidum, which is the actual rice in uh, China and the Asian parts, they'll be grown in bags and bags and bags. And to me, uh, I don't really see a beneficial uh, aspect to that because it's not really produced out of the own host tree that has those compounds initially whenever it's formed. Right. So if you really want to get into it, you can learn how to make your own textures, right? Right. Yeah. And, and uh, oh god, to be safe. So there is a good recipe that I have, and we're going to put on the website pretty soon. Uh, I keep forgetting to add it to the website, but it's a medicinal tincture for all medicinal fungi. Pretty much polypores is what it's. Uh, kind of geared towards like Ganoderma, which I kind of touched on earlier, or Trimides versicolor, the turkey tail. Uh, we'll have that on the website under uh, uh, cooking and recipes. Yeah, that's a good idea. So, oh, and I think you had a question. Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to the spores. Um, how long do they persist and where do we start finding them in um, the fossil record? Um, awesome record. Well, that's a good question because um, spores, uh, they don't really last a long time unless you have them kind of fossilized, right, somehow. Um, and, and they're very microscopic, like obviously you can't really see them once you make the eye. So for people to kind of uh, identify the spores, they would kind of have to look at the rock, right? So if it's a fossilized specimen, like a lot of times you'll find uh, people posting a long time ago, hundreds of millions of years ago, mushrooms were about 10 feet tall, yeah. right? So uh, they have these huge fossilized mushrooms that they find. And pretty much we can't really look at the spores because they're pretty much in the rock, right? So yeah, they dissolve <laughs> really easily. Yeah. So, but, so, so you know they're studying the beginning sediments for quite Well, that's something to look into. We could look yeah, into that. I, I, I haven't. Have have yeah, that would be really, really interesting. You had a question? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I sent, um, there's a company, um, called Freshcap, that I started looking across, um, but people have a hard time and they use the food market a lot. What was the name? Freshcap. Fresh oh, okay. So, uh, Stacy was mentioning that there's a company called Fresh Caps, and they're a good supplier of actual fruit bodies. Did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so is it possible for those cultivated spores to somehow cause extinction of uh, the mushrooms that grow in the wild? Hmm, that's, that's a good question. question. And they grow faster, so they uh, take over resources. I'm not sure if I understood that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if I understood your question. Right. She wants to know if cultivating mushroom spores, if they would get out in the wild, would they mess up the wild mushroom spores? Uh, well, they're the same spores from the same species, so I don't really understand. But like they grow on different mediums. Oh. And so oh. they kind of adapt to grow quicker on those mediums than if they were to be, like they would compete in the wild. Again. Right, so they're looking for the preferred habitat or a substrate is what you're kind of leaning towards. So pleurotus is kind of like the oyster mushrooms, right? And they're very variable. People are using them to grow it on trash or on plastic or because of its necessary need to kind of consume nutrition waste, right? So pretty much everything that we have in the landfill has nitrogen or carbohydrates that these mushrooms really want to consume. So, you know, as long as the food is there for them to eat and they're not very host specific, like mycorrhizal fungi, right? So they need to have that tree there to be present. And that's a kind of something that I've been trying to learn more about is how Amanita and mycorrhizal fungi pick their specific host trees, right? So 
Well, for example, like if they only prefer oak trees or coniferous trees, right? So um, that's something that uh, I try to ask Britt Bunyard, who's an Amanita uh, specialist, and he said that those trees that are susceptible to getting the fungus are kind of the ones that need the help from the fungus, right? So the symbiotic relationship, if it's there, right, then the fungus takes over and kind of fills that position. Yeah, right. I think you were moving, maybe your question is genetically engineered spores. So, and that's, that's another thing. But, uh, somebody, oh, yes. So, like, if a mushroom likes oak, oh, right. could you use oak sawdust, I mean, instead of the oak wood? Well, the mycorrhizal fungi, they'll only grow from the roots of the tree. So, um, if, if some of them, the, the, Polypores, the pathogenic fungi, sepals, some of them will just prefer like dead oak, right? So, uh, yes, you can use like uh, sawdust from oak to grow those to kind of supplement for that host that they prefer, right? So, if you find a fungus that is growing on conifer, then you want to use that specific wood to, to produce it. Right. So, any other questions? Yeah, ask questions about the club too? Or? Yeah, if anybody's got questions about the club, what we're doing, um, I mean, uh, I'm just going to talk about what we're going to be doing here in the future. We're kind of working on a weekend spring foray right now. Um, we're looking at a couple di different venues. Since we have a majority of you here, uh, we have two options, right? One of our options is more expensive, but I think we might be able to get a little bit better experience out of it. I don't know. I'm going to discuss it with you all and see what you all think, right? So there's this one ranch that has about 200 acres um, it's in White Right, White Right, I think it's the city name, and uh, it's called the Best Day Ever Ranch, right? So um, they have cabins that seat up to, that, well, not seat, but sleep up to four people each, right? Or you can camp there on property as well. Uh, this will be a Saturday, Sunday event, right? So we'll be there half the day Sunday and all day Saturday. Um, but they don't really offer us any, uh, you know, food, right? And, and the Wi-Fi <laughs> might be. <happy. laughs> so, but it, it's a nice location. They really use it for weddings, right? To have banquets and stuff like that. But they're converting their wedding hall for us to have presentations, kind of like this. And um, we're going to bring in speakers, and everybody uh, will have a chance to, you know, sit down at the presentation. But that's one option that we have. We're looking at was the best day ever ranch. They offered us eight cabins with the option of more if we need. And the thing I don't really like about that is during a pandemic, I don't want to cram strangers in the cabin with each other, right? Because, you know, like, this, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know? So that's the only thing that I was kind of iffy on about that. Um, we're looking at another location. It's in Denison. It's at a hotel, right? Oh, so Hilton the, the, the Hilton in Denison is now what we're looking at. They have a huge ballroom, right? So pretty much you'll have the option of getting a hotel room that night there. And at a lower rate, probably. Yeah, I don't think it was a little prorated rate, you know, but it's not much. <laughs> you know, it's probably like 10 bucks off. Uh, so um, what do you guys prefer? Do you prefer to have a hotel atmosphere, only have like this ballroom area, or do you like to have it in like kind of the wild, like in a little ranch area where you have cabins or camping available. Is it the same ground that we would be in the morning? Like so, so pretty much both of these locations are within about 20 minutes of each other. And we're going to be driving about 20 to 30 minutes to our So we'll have to sites. drive anyway. Yeah, so um, the one in Denison, it'll be closer to our 40 sites. That's a little bit of a plus there, the Colorado side. And they include breakfast yeah. in the morning. Yeah, they include breakfast uh, Sunday morning. dinner. So yeah, that one, it does accommodate for dinner. We'll have the option of getting a plated or buffet style. So, I mean, obviously I was going to say buffet because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, it's hard for us to cater to everybody's needs. So buffet just kind of, you know, has everything and everybody just kind of go in and grab what you want. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something else. Like I was going to go explore that if we were going to to look at it because I wanted each cabin to have facilities, right? So the bathroom, the shower, it has to be <laughs> in there, right? Because, uh, and then also people that are going to be camping at that location are going to have access to facilities like their shower and the restroom as well. So uh, they're charging $35 a night for camping or $150 to rent the cabin. 
and the hotel is about 120. So, and that includes meals. Yeah. Yeah. So the only thing about the cabin is we don't, we're not we're going to have to cater uh, food from some company to bring it into our location, right? So that can be done if you know everybody really likes the cabin, the ranch style, you know, thing that much. We, we have to look at like our that, finances you know? too. So. So that's pretty much what we're going to be doing. I'm going to be flying in Dr. Britt Bunyard. He wrote the book on Amanitas of North America. Uh, he'll be giving his lecture on Amanitas and doing his Amanita toxin presentation, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, only a, one or two clubs in the whole nation have ever seen this in person. So, yeah, I'm pretty excited. And he's also the new president of Noma, right? No, 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 no. no. He, he he's, uh, runs the Telluride Mushroom Festival. Oh, okay. You know, so uh, if anybody has questions about Telluride, I'm going to ask him. Uh, but yeah, so so far as options, if anybody has any suggestions. The Hilton has a cocktail. Yeah. The Hilton is cheaper for, for us to rent, you know, and it has like uh, everything is cohesive inside the building, right? So the cabins are a little bit spread apart. The camping area is spread apart, but she said she'd try to complete this Oh, I'll oh. get my two cents. Yeah. So, so um, pretty much those are our options right now. Um, we like the idea of having the hotel and just having everything central. Central, yeah. You yeah. Know, and, and having, you know, the buffet and everything just be kind of, right? So <laughs> um, we're leaning towards the hotel, but if everybody in the club really likes the ranch, <laughs> then we're going to have to go with the ranch. You know, so. so how many of you, oh, yeah. That's what I'm saying. I mean, especially yours is getting Started out, you know. Yeah. I mean, you're gonna have plenty of time right. to figure out something that's a little more difficult. Right. I would say just do what I mean, the easiest thing. Yeah, the easiest. And that's kind of how we're looking at it as well, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, because maybe next year we can afford the grand. We're looking to do two of these a year at least, right? So, and that's when the seasons are popping spring and fall, right? So, um, we'll try to do uh, a member suggested maybe even covering Friday night as well so friday night we'll do like the reception and kind of bring in everybody and do a little bit of talking but uh that idea i don't really agree with because some people work you know fridays and then they won't be able to make it there you know it's kind of just well, meet and greet like people have the option if they yeah. want to come out yeah. friday night like they can meet at happy hour or yeah. meet after so so, so that's you're responsible for it. that's that's, a, their that's an option that we'll keep open because the morning of the foray it's usually pandemonium Right, there's like 60 people, and we're trying to split apart in groups, and then we're going to go into our respective areas. So, uh, meaning, especially if you're coming from Tyler, you probably right, be right. So, um, you know, we're going to keep that option open because then that mean would mean that usually people would have to spend Friday night sleeping at the hotel. So that'd be two nights that people be at the hotel. But it'd be cool because we all wake up in the morning, eat breakfast, you know, I kind of talk, you know, everybody a little bit of uh, the itinerary of what's going on, and then we'll start splitting up in groups and head out to our location before it. The schedule is we're going to be foraging from 9 to 12 ish, and then from 12, we're going to be eating with our respective groups. Yes, ma'am. Uh, how would pricing be like if you wanted to bring like so it would be a hundred dollars a ticket for uh, uh, the weekend pass, and that includes the buffet on Saturday night. So uh, it's your option if you want to get a room at the hotel, or if you just want to drive there that day of, right, and kind of meet up with everybody. I'm not going to force everybody to get a hotel room. So in other words, if she brought a friend, the friend pays a hundred. Yeah, everybody would have to pay a hundred dollars because. Pretty much a good chunk of that is going to the buffet. Yeah, we're question. gonna have to charge a little bit more for those that are not members. Probably just ten bucks more. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you know our, our members should get first priority. Yeah, <laughs> and we were even thinking about be, making it exclusive to members only, but then we said no because it's such a you know, nice uh, well, event. <laughs> we should maybe if we get a hundred reservations. So I don't know how many yeah. Have. <laughs> yeah. So that's pretty much what we got going on for the four A's. Uh, we're gonna do some updates on the website, uh, which include uh, having all of our classes on the website. So all of y'all paying for a class, you'll be able to go back to and view the recorded version of it. And um, for those that haven't paid for the class, you'll have the option of viewing the recorded version for five dollars. 
And then once they pay for that $5, you always have the option of viewing the video in the future, right? And then we're also implementing a PDF library on the website. So uh, anything that's not copyright infringement, we're gonna try to put on that's helpful in mycology. So if anybody has PDFs they want to kind of submit to us to put on the website, you'll have that option as well. And finally, we're gonna be implementing an interactive map that shows locations that you can look for mushrooms within the Metroplex, right? So. I think we're the only club doing that. Yeah, we're the only club that has this idea and works right now. Um, and we're going to expand on that map to include specifics like type of trees or, you know, cool mushrooms if they were ever found in that location, kind of be known like, hey, this is a good area to go to. So um, that's pretty much it for the updates and, you know, class for today. I'd like to thank Ava. <laughs> Anybody has any more questions? A couple questions. On okay, let's see. Questions on let's here. see. Okay, uh, I can make this bigger now. Okay, the website says we offer age appropriate youth programs for children yes. to teach them the importance that fungi play in our ecosystem. It is imperative to instill these values early as it helps them avoid toxic chemicals. Is this incorporated into your forays, like the New Year and Spring forays, or would these be separate events? I can I can help uh, create a youth program for uh, the spring. And fall events, I'm, I'm going to be meeting with the uh, person who runs a youth program at the Nature Center in Capel, possibly uh, February, February 4th, or 3rd for meeting. So yeah, we're, we have that all in the works. Uh, the uh, National um, North America and Mycological Association has all these lesson plans, which are free to use for educators, and uh, we all have ideas. But yeah, there will be... We'll try to make a use program for the right. foray. Right. Yeah, uh, and, and even at our last foray, you you took all the years yeah, uh, uh, on the separate yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on a separate group. Yeah. But uh, we'd like to for anybody that will bring their kids to the forays, please make sure that you have your kid with you at all times and they're not wandering off. Okay. Um, last time we had some kids just wandering off, and when we're in the middle of the woods, that's not a very good thing to do to have your kid just wandering off. So please make sure that. You're watching your kids at our forays. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's stranger danger for one thing. There's copperhead snakes, and I noticed a lot of kids were climbing trees that had fallen, and those trees were like uh, they would just crash because right. the uh, fungi have been <laughs> decomposing them. So if you walk on a fallen tree, it goes right through and hurt yourself. So very careful, kitties. All right. Well, if anybody else has any questions. Well, we thank you all for coming thank here. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Look forward to the next. And if you have any questions or residual, just feel free to contact yeah, us. Yeah, if you always have any questions, feel free to email North Texas Mycology at gmail.com or find us on yeah. Facebook. Yeah. You can ask us here right now if you have any questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we call snacks. Yep. Throughout the galaxy. That's right. It's Green Creek.